Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you for praying with me on that. Man, that was a lot already. Hallelujah. Woo! Okay. Um, so we're going to go to Acts chapter 6, verse 1, if you're taking notes. So we hit pause on our Acts series last week, but we're right back into it this week. And if you remember what we've been looking at so far in the first five chapters of Acts is the way that God has been giving birth to the very first first century church after the resurrection of Jesus. And it's been a roller coaster ride, hasn't it? So much good and miracles and unity and uh, unselfish gratitude. And God has just done so much. He's grown them to more than 5,000 people. It's a huge, beautiful story of the birth of the early church. Um, the last time we were in Acts chapter 5, we had Ananias and Sapphira. And that was a tough one, wasn't it? This one today is another bit of a tough one. It's another attack from the enemy that comes against the church. And he's going to try to attack the church because it's so unified. He's going to try to attack them with division. And the way it's going to get solved, because God is going to solve it, is he's going to call all the members of the church to serve, not just the apostles, not just the pastors, not just the clergy. I'm titling today's message, Every Member Ministry every member ministry, because that's where this is going to take us. Acts chapter six, verse one. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. How many of you have ever heard rumblings in a church before? <laughs> right, exactly. The Greek speaking believers complained about the Hebrew speaking believers saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So first off, a little bit of context the believers are rapidly multiplied. So Dr. Luke has been telling us in every chapter in the book of Acts that God has been adding to the numbers of believers in the early church. The church at Jerusalem, that local church there had become a mega church. It was massive. And he keeps using the word God added, God added. Now he says God multiplied, which I don't know what that means. He doesn't give us numbers from here on out, but that's a lot. Amen. Amen. And then there were rumblings of discontent. You can kind of see the enemy does not like what's happening. So he's going to bring some problems. It's all going to be about how they solve those problems and face them. So there's Greek speaking and there's Hebrew speaking people in the church. So you're, you're kind of thinking pr their primary language, right? Like their first language is either Hebrew or it's Greek, but they're all in the same church. Now, you can draw all kinds of conclusions. Some might have a little bit more of a Gentile bent. Some of them might have more of a Jewish bent. But they're all believers in Jesus Christ. That's what unifies them. So if you've been with us as we talked about what unity is, unity is not sameness. Unity is not everybody being the same. They're different people. Unity is a choice you make for different people to become one. That's unity. And so what they have in common is they believe in Jesus Christ. And the enemy wants to come in and say, let's create some trouble and some, create some division here. So what, what's practically happening is they're handing out food to widows. They've got people in the church who are in need who can't totally take care of themselves. And if you remember from the previous chapters, there's a lot of giving that's going on in the church and they're trying to help people who are in need in the church. But people have to get in a line in order to get the food. And who goes first in line and who goes later? What was happening here is the Hebrew speaking widows were going first and people were letting them go first. And by the time you got to the Greek speaking widows, Either the best food wasn't there or they didn't have as much food, but they were getting overlooked somehow. How many of you know that when a church gets bigger, it becomes easier to overlook people? Yep. It's natural. It's part of just what was going on. The question was, what were they going to do with it? So they make the first good choice here. They tell the apostles Sometimes people get the, the attitude that if there's something broken, 
don't tell anybody about it because you're making trouble. No, you're not. You got to tell your leadership if something's broken, otherwise it can't be addressed. Somebody's got to bring it up. That's good. That's a good, healthy family operating in a good way. The problem was real. Verse two, so the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Now, we got to break that paragraph down because there's a whole lot of stuff that's happening there. and You got to be careful how you read it. The very first thing that I want to look at is not running a food program. (laughs) That sounds elitist, doesn't it? On a first reading, we're the apostles. We've got more important things to do. We're special, right? We're higher paid than you are. Um, So let's, let's have this little thing done by some little people while the big people are doing the big things. Do you hear any of that tone? I'm gonna challenge us to not read it that way. And here's the first reason why. And I think contextually, you're going to see a lot of stuff in the rest of the passage that is also going to battle against that tone. But the very first thing that I will tell you contextually is just months ago, Jesus Christ, the savior of the world and their rabbi had washed their feet. How could you have an elitist mentality after that? Not only had Jesus washed their feet and made it so plain to them that the kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. There aren't elitist people up here and lowly people down here. Jesus flipped it. He's I'm washing your feet. And then after he died and rose again, post-resurrection, guess where he meets the disciples? On the seashore after he cooked them a meal. He cooked them breakfast. He cooked them fish over an open fire. They're out there fishing and Jesus is waiting for them, having cooked them a nice meal. Who does that? Jesus does. Because Jesus is trying to make a point. Jesus is trying to make a point that even though I've just become, by the way, the name above all names. I'm king of the universe. That's Jesus, by the way even though I've done everything the father commanded me to do and I am worthy of all glory and honor, I'm making you breakfast. Come on. That had to shock them because it's not the way our world works. And so Jesus was constantly trying to turn it upside down. So when these guys are coming into the middle of this and they're like, listen, we can't run this food program. It's not because we're above it. It's because they have to stay focused. And you're going to see that in the passage here. Uh, They say, and so brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and full of the spirit and wisdom. They're delegating. I like to, that they ask the people who had felt wronged by this whole thing. And they said, you select the people that are going to fix it. They're going to people who are going to be sensitive to the problem, who are going to have a higher rate of success knowing that the problem's been actually fixed. I like this. They're partnering with the people. They give them the qualifications. They say, you guys go pick them, and then we're going to pray for them and install them later on or commission them later on. And then it says, so the apostles can spend time in prayer and teaching the word. That's them giving their own job description there. They say, we've been called to teach God's word and to pray. If we start doing this food program, we won't have time left over. And they're being protective of that. And here's the thing, and this, is, this gets a little bit academic, but they had to do this, guys. They had to do this. These 12 had spent three years with Jesus hanging on every single word he said. The reason you have the gospels is because the apostles listened to everything that Jesus said. They knew the teachings of Jesus, all of them. They're the ones who needed to teach. If you'd have been there, you would not have wanted these guys doing anything else except sharing more and more of the teachings of Jesus with you. 
And also, it's like, you can't just teach the words of Jesus. you got to teach the words of Jesus with the heart of Jesus. Amen. And, and maybe you've heard it before. You've heard someone teach God's words, but with the wrong heart. That doesn't work. That's where prayer comes in. Is if you're a pastor today, you need to teach God's word but with his heart, that means you've got to be in prayer. You've got to be seeking the Savior. You've got to be close to the heart of the Father yourself. Because when you go into that quiet place with the Lord in your quiet time, he's shaping you there. And you've got to let that shaping process happen. That's what these guys needed. They needed to stay in prayer, so they're delegating ministry. Verse 5, everyone liked this idea. And that's the last time that happened in church history where everybody liked a single idea. I just, it's a cheap laugh. Um, everybody liked the idea. I don't think that that is proof that they had done the right thing. I think God just blessed them there. There was unity. And they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Philip, and I'm not going to pronounce some of these right. Uh, Procurus, Nicanor, Tim, Timon, uh, Parmenas, um, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. Okay, one, one little thing I got through my study here. Every single one of those names, it's a Greek name. They're not Hebrew names. So whoever they put in charge of you go find the candidates that are going to fix this problem where Greek speaking widows are getting ignored. They chose seven Greek people to do it. Making sense? Just got to see that for a quick second. Also, it says that they presented them to the apostles. Again, this isn't a democratic moment or a congregational leadership moment necessarily. Wise leaders do this. Wise leaders Trust God's people appropriately. Wise leaders delegate to God's people. Wise leaders let go sometimes. Amen? Amen. And that says they laid their hands on them. Um, if you're new to the Bible, that might be a weird phrase to you. Uh, it's not violence, if I can just say that. <laughs> they laid their hands on them. Uh, we did this last week when we commissioned Pastor Jeremy to be on the pastoral staff here at Grace Fellowship. You might have noticed that when we went to pray, the elders put their hands either on his back or on his shoulder. It, it, it's a personal connection. It's a physical connection. It's a way to, to convey that we are family and we are in this prayer together. You'll see it all throughout the New Testament. Um, when they go to commission Paul and Barnabas out of Antioch to be some of the first missionaries um, out in uh, the, the Mediterranean area, it says that the elders of Antioch laid their hands on them and prayed for them. There are times when um, a spiritual leader is trying to convey a spiritual gift, a gift of the Holy Spirit or the filling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it says they, they will lay their hands on that person uh, while they're praying for them. There's th this phrase shows up over and over again. So if you're in your life group next and you need prayer, it's maybe even a good idea. Lay your hands on that person while you pray for them. I'll just tell you this. Ask them first. Especially if you're doing this across generations, especially if you're doing this across genders. Is it, here's how it goes. Is it okay if I put my hand on your shoulder while we pray? Just ask. They can say no. Is there a better location you would like? Anyway, you, you figure it out. <laughs> anyway, verse seven. I better keep going. So, God, so God's message continued to spread. No division, right? The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted to. I love that. Dr. Luke, as he recounts the birth of the early church, not only gives us the numbers, which is quantity, he also shows how um, the new converts were coming from uh, different classes of the people that were there in Jerusalem. Uh, when this broke through to the class of Jewish priests, this would have been a big deal to Dr. Luke. So he's telling us about it. Next verse, verse eight. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. That's an important verse. 
So we got right near the end of that. And if you remember, if you're paying attention real carefully, the first one named among the seven who were going to be the first deacons, by the way, who were serving in the church. The very first one was Stephen. And then it launches into this new narrative and says Stephen is performing miracles and doing miraculous signs among God's people. This opens up the next chapter and a half of the book of Acts, and it's all going to be about Stephen. Stephen, and I'll run the ending for you. Stephen is going to become the very first martyr of the early church. He has the honor of being the first martyr of the early church. Here's what's odd about this verse. And we're going to do all that next week. We're going to talk about Stephen. And the week after that, we're going to talk about Philip because that's the next chapter after that. Here's what's weird. Stephen and Philip, who get two and a half chapters, full chapters in the book of Acts of airtime, they are not apostles. And they are not pastors. And they are not priests or bishops or popes or whatever language you're used to. They're not any of that. They're just deacons. They're just, the New Testament word is servants. To be a deacon is to be a servant. So you guys have studied this before. You go over into 1 Timothy chapter 3, and you'll see qualifications given of elders. And these were teaching leaders in the church. And then you get qualifications of deacons. And they're not um, noted that they're apt to teach necessarily, but all the other qualifications are the same thing. The New Testament word is servants. They were servants. But servants who are getting a whole lot of airtime in the book of Acts. What in the heck is going on here? Upside down kingdom is what's going on. We don't just give airtime to the top dogs, right? Amen. There's 12 apostles, okay? Like you've read a lot about Peter and John so far. A little bit about Matthias. Where's everybody else? Where are all the other names? Most of the other names are not going to come up again or be written about at all for the rest of the book of Acts but we're hearing about Stephen. He's just a servant though. Have I made my point? Upside down kingdom. We're gonna, we're gonna look at Stephen next week. We're gonna look at Philip the week after that. And then on um, uh, Palm Sunday, the week before Easter, the Sunday before Easter, come back for that. I'm gonna do a special study for us just to cap off this first part of Acts. But I'm gonna go back to every single time that Jesus in the gospels talked about upside down kingdom where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. We're gonna look at that. We're gonna look at the moment where he talked about people who were serving at the table and people who were sitting at the table and the fact that he did all of that upside down, the fact where he said he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Upside down kingdom. Okay. This could have hurt the church. Let me tell you the ways this could have hurt the church. They could have ignored the problem. And maybe it would have gone away. You ever ignore a problem and just hope it would go away? Yeah. Happens all the time, doesn't it? They could have ignored the problem. It would not have gone away. They could have split or divided over this. They could have said, hey, Greek-speaking people, Greek-speaking widows, if you don't like it, go make yourself your own Greek-speaking Jesus church. That was certainly an option. They didn't do it. They chose unity. Also, if the 12 had fixed it, what would have happened? First off, it would have fed their ego and their sense of control. Come on. If somebody comes to the pastor and asks for a problem to be solved, I guess I better fix it. You feel that, don't you? Um, if you want it done the right way, you better... Do it yourself, right? All those, or even the people pleasing, right? The, the codependent people pleasing comes in. Well, they came to me and asked. Any of, the, any of the 12 disciples could have said that. We better fix it. I've had people come to me and say, you know, pastor, other people have tried to do stuff about this issue. We, we need to call in the big guns. We need you to come in and fix this issue. You know, you know how that helps my ego? so much, um, not. It would have put a lid on their problem solving. 
right? Because this would not have been the first problem to solve. The number of problems would have gone on and on and on, and this would have put a lid on their ability to grow or develop as a church. It would not have been good. Next, it would have diminished their preaching and their prayer. Eventually, at some point, they would have started, to, they would have had to show up on a Sunday morning to preach, and they didn't study that week because they were too busy on everything else. They're protecting it. And then lastly, the seven would never have gotten off the bench and gotten to serve. And that would have been sad. Because they followed God's way here, more people got off the bench and got in the game. Amen. And I love that. Um, I've told this story before. Back when I was in Illinois, I was the life groups pastor there for a long time. And there was a local seminary, and they invited me over one night uh, to, teach, to uh, talk to the, uh, uh, the students who were going through their life group program. And I was telling them how to build a life group ministry at their church. And we got to the end of it. And there was this one pastor there and he was like, um, I don't know how to do what you're talking about. And I'm like, what, what's wrong? And he's like, well, he's like, I've got six life groups in my church and I can't grow past that number. And I'm like, why not? And he's like, because I don't have any other nights of the week available. What do you mean? He was writing the curriculum for every single life group. And he was personally attending and doing the teaching at every single life group. Really sweet guy, by the way. Wonderful heart. But I'm like, why can't you just let them teach? And he's like, because I can't guarantee they won't speak heresy in the group. I get it. <laughs> You're going to have to let go, Luke, right? or Elsa, depending on your generation. Um, you got to let go. <laughs> You're going to have to trust the Holy Spirit in his people. Amen. I, I'm not saying you don't train them and you don't disciple them and you don't raise them up and show them how to do it. I'm not saying that you don't keep in contact with those people relationally and make sure that things are going well. Absolutely, you do all of that. But at some point, you got to trust God's people or you'll never do anything. You see the, you see the yeah, 12 apostles there trusting God's people to do ministry. It's massive. There's a lie out there that there are top spots in the kingdom of God, and the top spots are the most important, filled by the most educated, and the top spots need to fix and build everything, and it's a lie. Amen. That's wrong. God has a vision for every single person sitting here in this church today. He has a vision for you. He's gifted you. He's, he's got a destiny for you and a purpose for you. He's planned it out for you. I'm going to show that to you in just a little bit. Um, I went to Colorado. My, it, it was between my freshman and my sophomore year at college. Um, and I worked at a camp called Eagle Lake. And it was a great experience. And I learned a ton there and got to, got to be a camp counselor for, for kids and teach them about Jesus. It was awesome. But I remember there was this one day and we were at a volleyball court that was out there and um, it had these old like volleyball net poles, right? And they were all rusted and peeling and it was an ugly scene. And I was like, that's not good for kids. We got to fix that. And so I went to the camp director and I remember telling him, I'm like, we've got to fix that. Now, if you know me, that's tantamount to saying somebody ought to do a thing. And so he looks at me and he's like, I could give you some paint. <laughs> Brilliant. And like we had these kids all weekend long. And on Saturdays, we went down the mountain so we could do our laundry and chill out, maybe see a movie, whatever else. And then we were back for work on Monday. He's like, I'll have it waiting for you Saturday morning. So instead of going and doing my laundry that next Saturday, I went out to where the volleyball nets were and there's the can of paint and a brush. <laughs> As a good, wise leader in the kingdom of God because he let me get in the game. God has a vision for his church and it involves every single one of you. Ephesians chapter four, verse 12, look at this. Elders train God's people to serve. 
It says their responsibility right at the beginning of verse 12. When it says their responsibility, it means the responsibility of the elders, if you read that in context. The elders of the church is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So it's got this vision of God's church getting mature, growing up, being more and more like Jesus Christ, right? Everything gets better, but how does it happen? It starts two steps, actually. It says, first off, the elders are supposed to equip God's people, and then God's people are supposed to serve. God's people are supposed to work. We're supposed to do it. We're supposed to fix the problems and start the ministries and grow God's church under the direction of our leadership. Because what's the leadership supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to teach you the way of Jesus. We're supposed to teach you messages like today and show you what God's plan actually is and show you how it's in the book of Acts. I'm supposed to show you that. Our different staff members are supposed to train you in how to do ministry effectively inside this church so we're not all stepping all over each other, right? And then we're supposed to encourage you and we're supposed to inspire you. And after you've served, we're supposed to thank you and show gratitude to you because that's right. But those are the things that we're called to do. Your church staff and the pastors and the elders are not called to do all the ministry because we won't get it done. And listen, this isn't some kind of... um, Amway pyramid scheme, okay? This is not God's plan to get a whole lot of people doing all the work. That's not what it's about. It's about the fact that if you leave people on the bench, they have no purpose in the kingdom of God. And you do have purpose in the kingdom of God. You know the scripture that says um, that you are God's workmanship. Which the Greek there is poema. You're, you're God's work of art. You're God's workmanship. You've been created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. Now break down that idea really quick. That means from the creation of the world, you individually, God formed you, made you, and gave you a future purpose, a set of works that you were gonna do in the kingdom of God. That is your destiny, it is your calling. It is your purpose. This is also not lame little league. Everybody gets a trophy. It's not that either. Because what's lame about that picture? What's lame about that picture is that it's not actual success and effort and skill that gets somebody to the trophy in that picture. Where the trophy kind of means nothing. In the kingdom of God, You've been filled with the Holy Spirit and uniquely gifted to do what God has called you to do. That means if you're in the center of his will, you should be absolutely functioning in the power of the Holy Spirit and great things should be happening with the help of Jesus through your life. It's real. I'm trying to say it's real. Get off the bench today. Every member ministry. People come to church and they ask, who's the minister? All of you are the ministers in this church. It is not that the clergy do the spiritual things and everybody else does the practical things. It's all spiritual. Clergy are not more important. Clergy are not higher up somehow. Clergy are not worthy of special benefits or elite status. There are no top spots in the kingdom of God, period. It's messing with you, I know. Let's talk about service. Let's talk about serving. Let's let's talk about glamorous service versus unglamorous service for a second. Because some of it's unglamorous, right? Did you know people change diapers in this church every single Sunday? Somebody say, praise God. Praise God. Do you see these beautiful babies up here today? Praise God. Do you hear the words coming out of mom and dad? Jesus turning their lives upside down? They're going to raise these babies with the words of Christ? Does that inspire you? That's because somebody's changing those diapers every single Sunday. And mom and dad can be discipled and hear the word of God. 
It's huge, guys. Somebody's brewing coffee for you. They're coming early and they're brewing coffee for you every single Sunday. They brew extra for me, by the way, because I drink a lot of it. But they care about making sure that there's enough cups and there's enough creamers and all of that kind of stuff. They care about all of that. You're like, oh, I don't know if that matters. It all matters. It all matters, doesn't it? Yes. Those blue hand guys out in the parking lot, they matter. When my kids first came here, we first came here as a family from Illinois, and we came up into the parking lot for the very first time. You know what my kids remember about that morning is the blue hand guys. They're like, where's those blue hand guys at? They were fun. Smile in the parking lot, setting the mood, telling you that you're expected and wanted and, and loved. Uh, one of our head ushers um, comes and puts two cough drops at, on the front row for me every single Sunday because they know I talk a lot. And if I drink as much as I need to, I'll be running to the restroom all day long. So they hooked me up with some cough drops. Super nice of them. One of our producers on a producer team, um, they take this cup every single Sunday and they wash it down in the sink. They hand wash it. And most of our producers are more educated and accomplished in industry than I am. And they're washing that cup for me. That's kind, guys. That's upside down kingdom. That's just, we just serve each other. That's how this place runs. It's how it works. Did I mention 81 of you signed up to serve on Easter? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? And that's in addition to the people who are already signed up to serve at Easter. It's going to be an army of you guys out there. And we need you. Uh, we have a team of, uh, on Wednesday nights uh, at GSM, which is our students' ministry. Um, and all they do, it's the safety team. All they do is patrol the, the hallways and the outside of the building and make sure no one dangerous gets into our building. Because those students are worth protecting. I love that. Um, we've got small group leaders at, at our, our, our youth program on Wednesday nights. Um, and when I say small group leaders, you might know, not know what that means. Here's what it means. Like for the freshman class, there's a boys freshman group that does small group after the talk and the worship. And there's a girls freshman group. And the guys freshman group is led by a guy who is there every single week and knows your students' names and loves your students, knows their prayer, prayer requests, is in relationship with them every single week. Does that impress you? Because it should. That's, I, that's what matters to people is we want to be known, don't we? Minister to me and know me for sure. We have people that count our money after services every single week because your pastor should never touch money. Amen. I love that they do that. We have, people, we have a whole crew that comes in on Fridays and they clean these chairs because these chairs are black chairs and they're so hip and they're so comfortable and they're such cool chairs. But man, they like magnetize lint and hair like crazy. And people come in and clean hair and lint off of them for you. That's ministry. We got life group leaders that have Bible study groups that meet in their house every single week. Do you know they clean their house just for you? And they study God's word deeply so that you can come. They care. They're carrying your prayer requests. They're carrying your needs every single week. And it's a thankless job because they're doing it out there. And no one even sees them on a Sunday morning. But you know it's true. And by the way, in your life group, you've got a life group leader. They should not be making the treats as much as they're making them. You should step up and make the treats for your life group leader. Okay, the next cookout that needs to be organized in your life group, every member ministry. Can you say every member ministry? Yes. You organize the next cookout. You start keeping the prayer journal for your group. All of that stuff. Step up and help them. It doesn't need to be so burdensome for them. Uh, we've got a lady named Claudia that writes handwritten cards in this church. She started back the year of COVID, looking for a ministry. And when someone's sick or someone's in crisis or um, one of you guys writes a, um, 
your prayer request that's especially meaningful, she'd take a physical card out and, and hand write a card to you and a note to you and pray over you as she was sending the cards. Some of you guys in this room have gotten those cards from her. It's just, it was just like a year or so ago that she reached out to us and said, my hand's shaking so much I can't write the cards anymore. And so we got this lady named Brandy who is looking for a ministry, and Brandy's now writing the cards. And so Brandy and I and Amanda from the worship team, we got to go and have uh, breakfast one morning, and we got to honor Claudia for all that she had done and say thank you to her and, and hand the baton off to Brandy. Whew. People come here early, and they put those flags and those signs out down the road. You might remember the very first time you were trying to find this church for your very first visiting Sunday, and those flags helped you find it. You know how early and how dark it is and cold it is when they put those signs out? And if we didn't have those signs, everybody would go to the prettier church that's at the beginning of the road. (laughs) You all know it. We need those signs. (laughs) Last week, it was so full in here. We had some precious lady came in, and it was, it was just kind of jammed. And she was just like, you know, this second service, she's like, there's so much energy, and this is so great. She's like, this is good for you. She's like, but this just stresses me out. <laughs> and she was super sweet about it. And uh, one of the first impressions people um, said, hey, did you know that we're streaming this to a TV downstairs and there's a couch there, and there's like a little, little family area. And, and if you, you can come to third service, or you can just go right downstairs and, and, and watch the service happen down there, and, and you won't be as crowded. And, and gosh, that's TLC, guys. That's love, and it takes people to do all of that for real. Um, 81 people signed up to serve Easter. Okay, last thing. Matthew 10, 42. I want you to get the words of Jesus I cannot tell you how much I love Jesus. Amen. And I know I should say that, but I mean it. Um, everything Jesus said was good, um, stirs my soul. Look at what he says here. He says, and if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. Amen. Look at the way the Savior put those words together. Because he imagines a picture, and he's like, <laughs> The smallest thing imaginable, you just gave somebody a cup of water. And you didn't give an important person water, by the way. You gave the least person some water. And he's like, even that tiny little moment that you probably forgot in a minute in the church, Jesus says he remembers that, God remembers that, and God rewards that. I love that. And it's rewards to come but I think it's also rewards now. So I had a pastor, and I'll close with this. I had a pastor call me up recently, and they were like, hey, can I get your advice on something? And they were super new at it and stuff, and I'm like, sure. Um, and so we, we called, and we talked, and, and he painted this picture. He's like, okay, as a new pastor, he's like, sometimes I, I go to the grocery store, and I run into people who haven't been back to my church in like three months. And he's like, and it's super uncomfortable because they see me coming. And all of a sudden there's the pastor. It's like the last person in the world you wanted to see, right? Because he's going to judge me and, and all of this stuff. And, and he's like, what do I do in those conversations? He's like, because I love them. And I don't want to make them feel guilty. I just want to make them feel missed because they're family and I love them. So I can't act like it doesn't matter because it does. He's like, but not the guilt and not the weirdness and how do I do that? And we spend some time just kind of talking through that conversation and trying to give him some tips on that. But then we got to the end of it and I was like, but here's my extra credit advice for you. My extra credit advice is everybody drifts. Everybody. It's not just some of us. If you're not drifting away from the church, you're drifting away from the gym, amen? You're drifting away from your spouse. Some of you are doing online school and you're drifting away from that. 
anything that's healthy in your life, there's just something in our humanity. We just start drifting away from it, don't we? We get really strong in January and then by February, you know, all the exercise stuff is collecting dust. It's just the way we are. We do it with church. So my advice was, how about you connect the drifters to the church, to the family? Get them serving. Because as soon as you've got a job to do, it's harder to skip, isn't it? It's one thing if I had a, I had a difficult weekend and I work late and I don't really want to come and maybe I'm going to talk myself into not coming and all of a sudden three months or four months has gone by and I haven't been back. And what's tough about that is I haven't been surrounded by my family and I haven't been surrounded by the teachings of Jesus and I feel it. And as soon as I come back, man, I feel it. I'm so glad to be back. We've all had that. But man, I got to give you a job so you won't skip. Is that practical enough for you? When Jesus says anybody who does a service will be rewarded, i.e. blessed, I think one of the blessings is that you start doing the things that you want to do for yourself and you stay connected in with the family of God the way you want to be connected in with the family of God. So here's my challenge. Have you ever drifted? Ever? If you've drifted like I have, you need a job. If you've drifted, serve. What's your purpose? What are your gifts? Heck, maybe just become a greeter or a blue hand guy. Sign up. Grab one of those cards in the back in front of you. Say, I want to serve somehow. I'm not part of the 81 that's going to serve at Easter, but I want to be. I want to get involved. Get involved. Get a job. Plug in. Does that make sense today? Why don't you guys stand up? God prepared a purpose for you and he gifted you for it and he called you to it. He's given you a destiny. Walk in it. It's the healthiest thing for you. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing this Easter right now, God. And Lord, for the people in this room, the people that are online that are watching, Lord, I pray, God, that you would reach out to us individually and God, that you would just pull us into the body of Christ. Help us to jump on one of these teams so that we can have some people that miss us when we walk away. Uh, help us to get on one of these teams so there's people who know our name for real. Help us to get on one of these teams or get in a life group, Lord, so that there's people who are just carrying us through this life because the truth is we're not as strong as we think we are and we need it. Jesus, thank you. Christ's name.